Hello, welcome. Sorry, we're about, I'm a minute late. I never do that. Please tell us where you're tuning in from so that Molly and Louisa can see where you are. It's so fun. Molly and I are in Seattle. Louise and Louisa's in Germany, Chicago, Seattle, Edmonds. I love it. Madison, Wisconsin. Welcome, welcome. We'll let a few of you get tuned in and then we will get started. St. Albans. Hey, my sister-in-law used to live there. My nieces grew up there. Berlin. Hello, the Dominican Republic. I love this. Thank you so much, everyone, for letting us know. Navajo Nation, welcome. Bay Area. Yorkshire, hello, welcome. Clearly we did this at a great time of day because we're getting people from all over the place. Thank you so much. All right. More people from Germany, welcome. Homer, Alaska, wow. Is it even, is the sun even up yet there? All right, thank you everyone. Oh, this is wonderful, Sarajevo. All right, I think we are leveling off a little. So hello from India, hello India. All right, we're gonna get started. I think I can see the numbers starting to level off a tiny bit. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Laura Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop here in Seattle, Washington that's called Book Larder. We have a kitchen in our shop where we host a lot of author talks and teach cooking classes. And at the moment we have taken those events to Zoom so that we can still continue to celebrate books. And um, we're doing more, I think, things like we're doing today where we're just you know, taking a moment to bake and talk about the holiday season and uh, catch up with old friends. So thank you so much for joining us. One of the wonderful things about doing our events this way is that we can also have people from all over the world um, join us as authors and also uh, listen in. So thank you so much. We are, of course, celebrating the holiday season today with Louisa, Louisa, Louisa Weiss, excuse me, and classic German baking. Louisa's book came out in 2016. And um, as far as I'm concerned, it was really an instant classic. Uh, there is a recipe in this book. I've made a lot of things from this book, but there is a cherry coffee cake in this book that I made for my parents when um, they visited a few years ago. And uh, it has become a regular part of my repertoire and now my mom's repertoire. And I think is one of those recipes that will become sort of a cherished family recipe. It's that kind of book. Louisa is in Germany and is going to be demonstrating one of the recipes from the book today. She will be in conversation with her very good friend and fellow author, Molly Weisenberg, who is here in Seattle. Molly is the author most recently of a memoir called The Fixed Stars. Both classic German baking and The Fixed Stars, signed copies of both of them, are available on the Book Larder website, booklarder.com. You can support this talk um, by ordering your books from there. I know many of you will already have both of them, but they make great gifts too if you decide you want to pick up another co copy. Both Louisa and Molly have been very generous. Louisa sent us book plates and Molly signed um, copies of her book in the shop. So we have those for you as well. We will have time for questions. If you could please use the Q&A button to ask your questions because that's easier to keep track of than the chat. You can use the chat to talk to each other. If you have a comment, um, you know, feel free to leave it there. Um, but please use the Q&A button for any of the questions that you may have. So thank you again for joining us. And I'm going to turn things over to Louisa Weiss and Molly Weisenberg. Ta -da. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, everybody. This is so fun to do this at this time of day. I'm amazed by how many people were able to come. It's pretty amazing. I can just see the numbers. And yeah, it's really cool. So thank you all so much for joining. <laughs> and we are, we're sort of like bookending our days here. You're, you've like, you're getting your kids into bed, presumably. 
and I am just starting my day. Still, yeah. still have my cup of coffee here. Oh, good. <laughs> good yeah, morning. <laughs> I'm winning. Um, so I just wanted to say a little bit about how fun this is for me um, because you and I met. It's so weird, like talking to you, um, like interviewer style. Um, <laughs> you and I met. God, I think it was 2005. Um, I think I'd been blogging for less than a year. You'd been blogging around the same amount of time. Um, you were living in New York, a different lifetime for us both. Yeah. Um, and anyway, so it has been such a pleasure to get to follow your career. Um, I, I just pulled down off my shelf uh, your, oh God, it's upside down, my Berlin kitchen. Mm -hmm. your first book, um, which has a beautiful cover. I, I took the jacket off. Sorry about that. Um, right. Anyway, and I'm thrilled to be talking about classic German baking today because as, as Laura was saying, this book to me is like a forever kind of book. Um, mm -hmm. And I pull it out primarily at the holidays. So this is perfect. Um, for anybody who doesn't yet have this book, um, it has not only stuff that we're going to be talking about today, Christmas cookies, um, all sorts of traditional German recipes around Christmas time, but also um, torts, strudels, all of those yeasted cakes um, that I dream of, um, savory pastry, savory cakes and breads. Um, but today, I, I really, Louisa, I want you to tell us about German Christmas traditions as we get started today. Yeah, so um, as you probably know, Germany sort of invented modern Christmas as we know it, all the traditions with the tree and um, ornaments and um, Christmas and gingerbread and all of that stuff. Um, and there really is just like an endless supply of German Christmas recipes that I've had to whittle down uh, to, to fit into the book and the book, the chapter on Christmas is actually still twice the size of any other chapter. There are 24 recipes and knowing just how much is out there, it feels like a very small amount. Um, but I tried to include sort of the greatest hits, the ones that most Germans or frankly, yeah, most Germans would sort of feel like you can't have Christmas without. So like, for example, the, the Zimtsterne, which is a, um, they're star-shaped cookies made with chopped ground nuts and topped with a, with a meringue. A lot of Germans feel like those cookies, like Christmas isn't Christmas without those cookies. So those had to make it into the book. Um, Another one is the, the, the Elisenlebkuchen from Nuremberg, which are a, um, a nut and orange peel base baked on these little wafers and then either coated in a sugar glaze or a chocolate glaze. And those two are, I mean, a lot, most people don't actually make those at home. The Zimtstern are, are a homemade thing, but most people buy Elisenlebkuchen, but they're really easy to make and um, really nice. And yeah, so I tried to sort of include all the recipes that I thought were the most emblematic. And will you, so this morning I read again, this section, Christmas favorites, where you sort of talk about kind of the tradition of Advent Sundays and when, when these cookies, the, the many roles that these cookies serve in, in celebrating the Christmas holidays. Yeah, so um, in Germany, Christmas, the Christmas season starts obviously with the first Advent weekend. The Advent weekends are the four weekends before Christmas. And um, they're traditionally a time when um, people get together either with family or with friends on the, on the Sunday afternoon and um, light candles and eat copious amounts of cookies and stollen or other sort of Christmassy cakes, fruit bread and drink tea or coffee and um, listen to Christmas music, whatever, whatever your Christmas heart desires. And um, people also give Christmas cookies as gifts. So a lot of bakers will, a lot of people who make cookies for the holidays will sort of start in November, early December, so that by the time Advent gets started, they're ready with their little, beautiful little glassine bags filled with the perfect assortment of cookies. You can't just make one 
you have to make like, you know, 10 or 15 or my friend Maya who helped me on the book sometimes makes like 20 different kinds of cookies. Um, that's not the norm, but she's very good at it. Um, and so, and then the, the cookies, not only are you offering them to your friends and family or whatever, but they're also featured sort of on the table on like a plate called the Bunta Tella, where you arrange all the different cookies that you've made or that you've purchased because not everybody wants to make homemade cookies and that's totally fine too. And, um, and then, so like if you have kids, sometimes the kids will each have their own Bunta Tella and they can add sort of, they can you know have a larger assortment of the cookies they really love and fewer of the ones they don't like or whatever, personalized cookie plates. Well, will you tell us about the cookies we're going to make today? And, and we could, you could go ahead and show us how to make the dough. Yes. So um, the cookies we're going to make today are called Bibale. Maya told me about them. They are a, a honey gingerbread, which is really sort of chewy, baked around a log of marzipan and then cut into chunks. So they basically look like combos-ish. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, so, so my, my daughter loves these cookies. She is, I'm going to go awesome. pick her up at her dad's house at, right after this. And she is so excited that these cookies are going to be here. Um, but I have to tell you, um, so she, I, this is terrible. She calls them dog treats because there's some sort of dog treat that they look like. Yeah. Right? Yes. They kind I feel like that's do. terrible. I was like, I can't tell Louisa that. And then I was like, but that, what but that's it the is. Associate, yeah, no, I, I, I see a combo. I don't have a dog, but I, I know what treat you're talking about or what June's talking about. And I, and I, I get it. It's totally fine. I think these are more delicious than dog treats. I, I do I also think only they're more delicious cookies. than combos, but it's a different kind of flavor profile. So <laughs> Um, well, and what, what's so wonderful about these, Louisa, I wanted to add is that um, people should make them now because they only get better with age. Yes, so. they get better, they get more flavorful, they get sort of chewy. And um, especially when you're making a lot of cookies for the holidays, it's good to have ones that can last for a while because you can't bake 11 types of cookies in a day. You have to sort of spread it out and then you sort of know, oh, the cookie, these ones are ones that I can make and then just don't have to worry about them getting stale. Um, yeah. So Take it we away. get started? Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I've sort of jerry-rigged my computer on a salt container. It's all very whatever. I'm gonna be working over here. If you want more view into what I'm doing, let me know and I will, I'll transport, but I'll, I'll I'll try and describe everything that I'm doing. So basically the first step is to um, melt together butter, brown sugar, and honey. Um, and I use a scale because even though I used to be a devoted cups person, it's just easier. It just is. While, so while you measure it, I have a cautionary tale. So yes. I, Louisa knows this. I told her before we went live, but uh, I had to. <laughs> I've made this. I've made these cookies before. They're a favorite in our household. And yet, when I went to make the dough this morning, I measured out all of it by weight except the butter. And as a result, I just like read the butter quantity too fast. I used too little butter and the dough didn't work and I had to make it a second time. So everybody use the weight measurement. Yeah, it's a lot easier, it's a lot yeah. easier. Okay, so I've measured out my, my honey and now see, I don't even have to, I just have to press zero and I can go back to measuring the sugar. I don't have this recipe memorized, so I have to keep referring to the... I think it's what, 75 grams of sugar? Yes, thank you. Light brown it's sugar? It's light brown sugar. It's actually really hard to get um, these types of sugars in Germany. I have to buy it at like the Asian grocery store. They'll sell it. Or I bring it back with me from the US, but I haven't been there in a while because of that <clears throat> pandemic thing. <laughs> and then butter, we need 65 grams. And I use um, German butter. In the book, I specify that 
it would be better if you use the sort of high fat European style butter is, as it's called in the US because it adds a little bit of nice richness, but 65. Yeah, I think it does make a difference. It's like 85% fat as opposed to 82 or sometimes even 80. Yeah. More, I think 82 is standard in the US, maybe 80. Yeah, and I feel like some recipes you can get away with just using a you know an American butter with less butter fat, but I try in the book to specify with, when I think it's important and when I don't, because I wrote the book for American um, bakers or you know people with access to American ingredients. So sometimes it's annoying to have to go hunt down a specialty butter, but sometimes it's worth it. Okay, so we're gonna bring this to. Um, this doesn't have to boil; it just has to melt and liquefy. And while that's happening on the stove, can you see my stove? Yeah. I'm going to um, measure the dry ingredients. Oh, and what I was going to say is I made the, the, the batch of dough that I'm going to use to demonstrate how to make these is with regular all-purpose flour. But um, for the sake of experimentation, I'm going to make this batch with a gluten-free flour blend just to see how it goes. I've never tried it before. And I will post the results of it or something on my Instagram or whatever, because they won't be ready until we're done. And um, obviously maybe like tomorrow. And then you guys, if you, any of you are gluten-free, you hopefully will have the knowledge that this recipe is fine. I don't, I don't actually know for sure. Um, Louisa, okay. do you have a preferred brand of scale? Um, the one I'm using is a Salter scale. I think those are available in the US. I, I yeah. feel like they're very accurate, mm -hmm. easy, well-priced. I think mine costs 14 euros or something. Yeah. I, we had a question about which recipe this is and how it's spelled. I don't know if this is backwards, but oh, it's B-I-B-E-R-L-E. And it's on uh, page 226 of the book. So when after the um, after the the honey butter and uh, brown sugar mixture has melted and is all smooth, does it have to get? So you say to fully cool it. Um, I wound up setting mine outside on the deck. Um, is that just so that it it isn't really the dough isn't really sticky at the end? Well, as a matter of fact, the batch that I made this morning. Um, I didn't wait for it to cool because I was in a rush. <laughs> and what I had to end up doing was cool, let the dough cool before I could put it in the fridge because it really was too hot to go in the fridge. Okay. okay. Um, so in that sense, you should let it cool, but I don't actually think it affects the dough making process if it's on the warm side. Okay. Okay, so flour. Then we need a teaspoon of ground cinnamon and then a teaspoon of the Lebkuchengewurz, which is this spice mixture that's used for gingerbread, any kind of gingerbread mixture. I have a recipe for it in the book. <laughs> yep, do you wanna talk about yours? <laughs> I do, I do. So Louisa and I had a conversation about a week ago to talk about what we were gonna do here this morning. Um, and I was like very sheepish. I was gonna pull this jar out of my spice cabinet and show you, Louisa, that I, I had made the spice mix. But then I looked at it and I realized it was from December of 2018. And I thought, oh God, Louisa is totally going to look down on me for keeping my spices this long. I know that we are supposed to use fresh spices, but I was still relieved when you were like, ah, that's fine, that's totally normal. So yeah. anyway, yeah, because yeah. I'll be honest, you know, even though these particular cookies I've made multiple times, I just, I'm not going through this that fast. Right. So I'm glad to know that this can keep. It's okay, it's okay. You could, if you had space in your freezer, you could put spices in your freezer, they last 
even longer that way, but um, not everybody has that much room in their freezer. Um, um, Louisa, okay, so, a couple, oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, this is just um, the, the flour and spices and a teaspoon of baking powder and then some salt. And then this extremely complicated dough uh, is almost finished because all you have to do then is take this liquid sugar butter mixture and stir it in, which I do with just a regular old spoon. Now I noticed when you measured out your honey that it looked, is it creamed honey or is it like regular runny honey? It's runny creamed honey. <laughs> It's okay. a so, fresh jar. I can show it to you. Um, so either of them would be okay then, creamed honey yes. or regular? Uh, whatever honey you've got. Um, this okay. is kind of runny, but it is creamed. Okay. It says, in German, it says zart cremig, which, which means gently creamed. <laughs> That's how I like my honey. Yeah. Gently exactly. creamed. Gently creamed. Um, okay, so this this is it. Like you just kind of stir it until it comes together. The nice thing about this dough is that you don't really have to worry about overworking it or, you know, being gentle with it the way you do with more sort of short ready butter based doughs. I wound up really kind of getting my hands in there and really sort of kneading it to incorporate all the flour. You did? Did you, was it drier than this? Yes, mine was drier than that. Um, and I don't know if it's the flat, because I, I, yeah, I measured everything by weight. Yeah. Um, but yeah, mine well, wound remember, up drier than that. This is a gluten-free one now, the one that I'm making. This is a, a gluten-free, so that might mean that it's a little runnier. I was going to say, yeah, mine definitely was a, a more, you know, uh, what I think of as a more traditional dough texture. And mine is a little lighter in color. That might have been also because you let yours cool properly, the way it says to in the recipe. Unlike this. Okay. <laughs> Which I done. okay, so this is the finished dough. It looks kind of loose and like, how are you going to be able to roll that? Well, this is going to go in the fridge in a little second. Um, and in the meantime, this is the one I made earlier. And it is hard as a rock. So rock hard. Yeah, it, the, the, the heat, once, the, once it's cooled off, it becomes much more like a dough that you expect, basically. So yeah. um, Someone is asking about the brown sugar, um, if they can use raw cane sugar, but brown sugar really is a different thing, different texture, finer grains, more molasses, right? More or moisture, more yeah. yeah. Yeah, you don't wanna use a, a sort of granulated brown sugar. You wanna use the classic sort of soft brown sugar. And if you only have dark and versus light, it's fine. You don't have to really worry so much about the light versus dark, but it should be that soft. Can you guys see that? That sort of soft kind of like wet mm -hmm. sand. Okay. Sugar. So Which yeah, my go, um, well, I, 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 I did a whole bunch of things different this morning because I was rushing after I had messed up my dough. Anyway, I, while the dough was still, while I was still um, bringing it together, I went ahead and separated it into eight portions, knowing that later we'd be separating it into eight portions. And I rolled them up individually. Oh my goodness. That is um, brilliant. I was really... I was losing it by that point, Louisa. I hadn't even made my coffee yet. I was like, I, I can't oh, deal so with sorry. trying to portion this later. Anyway, but I have to say, this is kind of nice. So I've got this whole like Tupperware with my eight pre-portioned. Do you know who would approve is Maya. She would approve. That is like, that is a Maya move. She would. That I, is the I highest think. compliment you could give me. <laughs> I mean, I, she can join. I'm not sure she's here but if she is listening she can definitely join in or people who know maya might be and they can corroborate that this is a total maya move um okay so basically the hard the easy part is over which is making the dough and the hard part is rolling it out so let me just gather myself for a minute so 
What we're stuffing the cookies with is almond paste. In German, marzipan is also sold as marzipan Rohmasse for all of the Germans. Marzipan Rohmasse is almond paste and marzipan is actually has more sugar added to it. So as if you're living in the US and you're looking for either marzipan or almond paste, buy the almond paste, that's what we need here. Um, and it's a very sort of, if it's fresh, it's, it's soft and squishy. You can see that I can sort of squish the package. You can also make it yourself. There's a recipe in the, in the book, in the basics chapter that tells you how to make it yourself. This is, oh, a, yeah. this is the brand that I tend to use. Um, I flattened my box, put it in the recycling. Um, but anyway, um, this brand or solo brand, yes. I can find yes. pretty easily. Exactly. And a, a mutual friend of ours, Shauna Sieber, she made her own, I think yesterday, I don't know, she posted a picture of herself with two pounds of, um, of almond paste. So you can also just do it yourself. It's, I think it might even be cheaper to do it yourself. I don't know. It's expensive. Um, I have to say that I almost had a total tragedy, not tragedy, but um, I went to the store this morning. I left this at the last minute because this is something you can find at any corner store in Germany. And I went to the store this morning to get ready for our event and the store was sold out. And not only was it sold out, they didn't know when it would be coming back. And I was like, but what do you mean? How, what? So I sent my Christmas husband- Christmas in out. Germany. Yeah, You're I sent my husband own. out and he had to go to three different stores. So I was this close to making my own, which would have not been as much fun as just buying it pre-made. Luckily for my intrepid husband, he delivered. I, I, um, so mine came in tubes and I used a scale and portioned it out into eight portions. And uh, anyway, I'm going like to roll work. them. It's like you have a restaurant or like you once had a restaurant or something. Like I once had a restaurant. It's like I was <laughs> really, it's like I was very briefly a professional cook. So briefly. <laughs> okay, hold on. I'm going to move my camera here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so um, first thing first, preheat the oven. Oh yeah. Okay. Wait, what are we preheating it to? Hold on. Preheating it to... 400 degrees Fahrenheit, 200 degrees Celsius. And I made a chicken last week. Ugh, my oven smells like chicken. It's not gonna, let's hope it goes away. Yeah, I desperately need to clean my oven. <laughs> Don't um, tell. Yeah. Okay, so for anybody to know. Yeah, <laughs> we just broadcast it. So, um, your trusty scale will help you divide this into the portions that you want. So basically what we're doing is we're dividing the dough and the marzipan into manageable portions because you're rolling them out into very thin strips and rolls of marzipan. And if you did that with them all in one go, it would be totally unwieldy. So we make everything in small amounts so that it's easier to deal with. And Am I correct that we want these logs of marzipan ultimately to be like nine inches? Yes. Is that right? Okay. Right. right. So um, I, go I on. Ask a quick marzipan question. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a question about if you have a preferred brand and then another, can you use other kinds of nuts besides almonds if you were going to make your own? You need a paste, you need it to be a nut paste that's rollable. I don't actually know of marzipan or made with anything else. Like pistachio paste is more of a spoonable texture, which wouldn't work here. I'm sure there is such a thing as like walnut marzipan, but I personally don't. I've never used it in this recipe. Is this because someone's allergic to almonds or doesn't like almonds? I, I think we, I think, I think I saw at least one person who doesn't like almonds, but there are so many other Christmas cookies. Yes. I would say that if you don't like almonds, that's totally fine. There are other German Christmas cookies that are, that will be up your alley. For example, Zimtsterne or Basler Brunsli, which are um, Swiss cookies with ground 
Or am I mixing it up? Oh my goodness. Maybe I am mixing it up with hazelnuts. Maybe that one has almonds. Anyway, there are lots of other cookies in the book that don't have almonds. Okay. Molly, are you good at math? So uh, are you wanting to know what 300 divided by eight is? No, actually I was wondering what 530 divided by eight is. Oh, 530, wait a minute. You're doing 530 grams of almond paste? No, this is, so I wanna divide the dough oh. into eight equal amounts. I've got this for you, Louisa, hang on. You <laughs> wow, we are really, okay, 530 divided by eight. 66.2. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Jenna. I think it was Jenna who was great. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you, Jenna. <laughs> okay, so while you're portioning that into 66 grams per portion, um, Louisa, someone asked, um, what would the, okay, wait, hold on. How is this phrased? Um, the original recipe for these cookies what would it have used instead of like American brown sugar? What, what would you be able to get in Europe? That is a good question. Or what would have been original? I'm not actually sure anymore. <laughs> I wrote this, this book came out four years ago. I have forgotten some things, but um, it was probably um, uh, just more, more honey. It might have also been something called zucchabubensirup, which is a kind of molasses made from sugar beets that's, that has been used traditionally in baking. It might have been mm -hmm. that. Uh, it's, um, let's see, Sarah is telling us that the UK has been a major trader of brown sugar for centuries. Mm -hmm. So there's a chance that, that brown sugar would have been available for a very long time. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so you're portioning the dough into eight different portions. I have portioned my um, almond paste into eight portions, and that was 300 grams of almond paste into eight portions. So that's 38 grams about per portion. Okay. 38. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> Math is not my strong suit. Louisa, yeah. are you doing a lot of Christmas baking this year? I made, so I made, um, I, I sort of end up making cookies haphazardly. <laughs> I have to be honest. Um, this year I made Springala with my beloved friend Joni, um, who's 84. So it's a bit fraught because we have to be really careful and not come too close to each other and stuff. But the tradition is just we always make springale, which are these molded anise flavored cookies um, from southern Germany. So I couldn't, I kind of couldn't resist that. And I, I feel it, like it, from, oh, sorry. No, go for it. Go ahead. I was going to say, from having read your work for so many years, I feel like there's this cast of characters um, <laughs> in your life who I know. Yeah. And Tony is, is like the, among the most beloved to me. I, I got to come to your wedding and I met yeah. Joni and her family That's there, right. but my gosh, every time you post a photo from Joni's apartment or God, there was one you posted the other day that was like an end table with a painting above it and yes. a very natural looking stack of human life on top of it. Um, oh yeah. Oh my yeah. God. What a treasure she is. Joni is truly uh, a star in my life. I have known her since I was born, since she was my friend with my parents long before I ever appeared. And she's like my, my second mother, really. She was my nanny when I was a baby and she and her husband, I was like their fourth. They had three children and then they had me. And I've always felt very honored that I was considered the honorary fourth child oh, and Dietrich sadly died that. this year so Joni's um no longer Joni and Dietrich but she always will be in my mind really 
Oh, I love that. Yeah. And I, I'm and gonna, she, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I was just saying that she, she obviously bakes a little bit less now, but not that much less than you. Um, and at Christmas time, people just have expectations, you know, they need their cookies. They need their traditional, okay. I have a hard time doing math and talking at the same time, if you haven't noticed. You, you are doing great. Okay. Um, someone is asking if this recipe can be doubled. Have you tried doubling it? No, I haven't, but I'm sure it could be. It's an easy, this dough is pretty forgiving. Mm. Okay. There's a little treat I, left over. You can um, what does the, so I, I'm terrified to pronounce these cookies. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say it again for me? Of these cookies? Yeah. Bibala. I actually have a pronunciation guide in the back of the book that was my favorite thing about writing this book. It was so funny. And giving it to all of my German friends and getting them to proofread <laughs> how I had interpreted the, inter the pronunciation into sounds that Americans can make. So, Bibele, Bibele, Bibele. And um, the L at the end of it sort of indicates that it comes from Swabia or this a, a state in southern Germany, a region in southern Germany. And um, but a biba is a beaver. I'm not okay. quite sure what these have to do, or if this has nothing to do with beavers. I forgot. I should have asked Maya before I came on here. I wonder what she's doing. Anyway. Well we we are out. all if I find all... out. <laughs> I'll let you know. Hang on, okay. I'm gonna go my hands off for a second. Hold on, I'm looking through the questions. Um, Louisa, while you are, is it okay for me to ask you a couple more questions while you're portioning yeah. things? And, okay, so, um, so we've got a couple questions about other baked goods in the book. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the main function of ripening the dough for Lebkuchen? I don't know if I okay. said that right. Yes, so the, the Lebkuchen that has to ripen for two months, that's the first recipe in the Christmas chapter. And it's for sort of a traditional old fashioned German gingerbread, which is kind of chewy and has a really nice airy texture that's achieved by using um, pot ash rather than baking soda. And the, it, it, the dough ripens for like two months. It can also, ripen for less. And frankly, you could make it like the day after you made that, you could bake them the day after. But what happens during the ripening process of when the dough is resting in a cool, dry place is the there's a, some kind of flavor alchemy going on. And Maya and I tested these, I think with one day of rest, 14 days of rest, four weeks of rest and two months of rest because we were kind of skeptical, like, is this really going to make a difference if it's two months or one month or two weeks or whatever? And what we found is that the two month really made a difference. The cookies are incredibly delicious. They are really, um, they have kind of like a, a well-rounded, full, rich flavor um, mm -hmm. that, that you just don't get when they've only been ripened for a day or whatever. But that having been said, obviously, if you only have two weeks, two weeks are fine. They're still going to be nice cookies, especially if you dunk them in chocolate. But if you want the like full German housefrau experience, go for the, and you have the time to do it, do go for the two months. But, and the, the, also those cookies, they improve with age once you bake them and they're really sturdy. So they're great for shipping and gifting because you can just put them in a bag, stick them in the mail, even if it takes like a week or two weeks to get to wherever they're going, they're still gonna be fine. And the same thing goes for these that we're making today, the Bibula. Um, yeah. They nice. are really, <laughs> very good. <laughs> they are really sturdy and they keep for a long time delicious to be like delicious dunked in tea. Yes. Like this kind of cookie really, yeah, it, this, this cookie says like afternoon cup of tea to me. 
Yes. And, and the nice thing cookies. about them is that they don't break. Like there's, they're not brittle. So there's no breakage in like a cookie right. tin. Whatever. And they're not, um, they're not like a short dough that's going to crumble. Crumble, so, exactly. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's get to rolling because these are a little bit fussy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put this out of the way. And in a minute, Louisa, will you talk about sort of the history of of pot ash, I think it's pronounced. You mentioned mm -hmm. that like a traditional leavening. Yes, yes. Okay, hang on just a second because I need to. <laughs> sure, no, no. You, you, you do your thing. <laughs> okay, so as I showed you before, the dough is really hard, right? And somebody wrote to me on Instagram earlier today, concerned because her dough was so hard. It, it, it was in the fridge. It's the minute you take it out and you start to sort of work it, it's, it becomes not hard. It's easy to roll. And also, as you'll notice, it's not sticky. Um, it's a really lovely, easy dough to roll out. You don't, you're not going to need a lot of flour to, to deal with this. Okay. So anyway, so here it is. And we're rolling it out to Four and a half by nine and a half inch rectangle. Um, Maya told me that people should roll it out, which is why it's in the book this way, with plastic. Okay. Because it makes the, the rolling together with the marzipan later a little bit easier. So roll it out between two sheets of plastic wrap. Right. Right. Okay. And it shouldn't. It, it shouldn't stick. Regardless, this is less about the sticking and more just about making it easier later. So you've got your cute little pre-portioned piece. Put it in the middle. Get your rolling pin. Nice. What so size are we going for again? Day? How many rolling pins do you have, Molly? Just anecdotal. I have one rolling pin. Okay. I used to have. My mother's old rolling pin, which was the more traditional type with handles. Yep. And I broke it, whacking, some down, whacking it down on some really hard dough. <laughs> oh my God. I know, yeah. I'm very powerful. <laughs> I guess that's the takeaway. Image. <laughs> well, so I also only have, wait, do I have another? No, I only have one rolling pin because I'm obsessed with this rolling pin, it's so nice. But when I was at Joni's the other day, she has a rolling pin that could kill someone. It's huge and heavy. And I was remarking on it. She was, oh, she was using it. We were making um, seed crackers. And, she, and I was asking her about it. And she said, oh, well, this is only one of three or four rolling pins that I have, each with different purposes. <laughs> so I'm going to have to like interview her about her rolling pin sometime. And is yours a French pin? Does it taper at the end? Is that yes. Yeah. yeah. So my dough is, is a little colder than yours. Okay. So taking me a little more time to roll it out. And yeah, mine is such a different, a different consistency, which is so funny because yeah, I've made this before. And for me, it's always been this consistency, a little, a, just a little drier than yours. I'm guessing maybe it's the flour I have available. Maybe? Probably. It, it probably is, or maybe the butter. Um... There might be a little bit more fat in my butter, or maybe the, who knows, it could also be a temperature thing, you know, mm -hmm. if it's colder here or warmer where you are or whatever. I have managed to not make a rectangle at all. I have managed to make something really janky. <laughs> Fantastic, okay. I'm having so, a great time uh, now. Do you keep a measuring tape in your kitchen? I keep a ruler. Look, this one cost me 25 cents. Oh, nice. I keep a ruler in my kitchen. Uh-huh. I keep, so do you know the store Net-A-Porter? It's the, what, the yeah. like fancy web shop. Back when they were, you know, young and solvent and whatever, um, they would send one of these with every one of their orders. And I kept one and it is one of my prized possessions. 
Wow. Fantastic. It's inches on one side, centimeters on the other. It's very chic. It fits into my kitchen drawer and it has one of those little buttons, you know, that it's like a dressmaker's, but I only use it in the kitchen anyway. And that's so. great. Cause I bet it stays pretty clean too. There's like not a lot of crevices for yeah. flour to get or stuff like that. But like we heavy duty use this when we were testing for the, um, the book. I mean, we used it every day, all day for a year and a half. Um, and it still works and it's awesome. And, and my kids are obsessed with it. They always want to play with it. And I'm like, don't touch my <laughs> measuring I, tape. You know, I bought June. I had to buy her all these school supplies for doing school at home. And um, I bought like a four pack of a, a very cheap and flimsy version of that same mm -hmm. type of measuring tape. But anyway, that means that I have a couple extra and I should seal them for the kitchen. Okay, so we're going to four and a half by nine and a half ish, right? Yes. Okay. Ish. Okay. Yeah. I, think I, I think this is good enough. Yeah, I feel like I'm a pretty lazy baker compared to my friend Maya. Luckily for all of you, she <laughs> was instrumental in getting me to be more diligent. Okay, and I'm gonna get, we need a little bowl of cold water, right? And a pastry brush. Yeah. Okay. okay. Quick question. Would parchment work as well as plastic wrap? Um, it would work. I think I think it would work, yeah. What? I think it would work. I mean, obviously, we, it would be nice to use less plastic. I like the fact that the plastic allows you to see the dough. Um, it is nice in a minute when we're roll when we'll roll it up. Yeah, that's nice because it's got some flexibility to it, right? Yeah, yeah. I think I would say. You could if you were an avowed anti-plastic person, but I prefer using plastic wrap. Okay, Louisa. So I'm. Okay. I'm. You I'm. Learn to do your some... marshmallow rolls. Okay, so and this is what it looks like for everybody to see, right? It's about nine and a half by four and a half. And then we're rolling out the marzipan, which Molly, you already. Oh, look at you with your little marzipan rolls. That's very nice. I have to tell you, I've taught some cooking classes before and I feel like I'm really bad at it. Like I always run way over time and it's just not my strong suit, but by God, I feel like I'm, I'm doing a pretty good job here today. We're- um, It's all the planning ahead, you know, having it all measured out. I feel like that's very professional, very, I'm impressed. <laughs> small victories, small victories. This makes up for the fact that I had to make the dough uh, twice because I messed it up. Exactly. All right, so here we go. We've got our little nine and a half inch log. And we're gonna take the top layer of plastic wrap off. Um, and then you're gonna Position it sort of towards this end side. How do I say this? If you've got the, the long side, here we go, wait a minute. This is where the screen. If you've got the, the, the gingerbread rolled out with the long side sort of up, <laughs> and then you take the log and you place it towards the edge. Does that make sense? Okay, mm -hmm. then. Yeah, you place it along your, one long uh, edge. Yes, thank you. Take your paste, pastry brush and make it wet. And, oh wait, I'm sorry, hang on. You make, you make the dough, you brush the dough with cold water first, all of it thinly. And then you place the marzipan log on the top end. 
And then you use the pastry, sorry, the plastic wrap. I'm gonna do it the other way around. Can you guys see what I'm doing? I can't really tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you Hang just on. sort of roll it. Mm -hmm. And using the plastic wrap as a sling, sort of. Yeah. You kind of go like this. I don't know if it's visible. I'm going to bring the computer a little closer. Can you? Can everybody see what I'm doing? That's perfect. Do go like this. Okay. And then once it's all rolled up, you want the seam. So where the end of the dough sort of meets the dough to be on the bottom, because what you're trying to do as you roll it out is to make the seam disappear. And what you're also trying to do is eliminate any air pockets between the log of marzipan and the gingerbread casing. Oh God. So Louisa, my, my jumping ahead of you is backfiring on me because I did not roll mine until the seam disappeared and I have some little air pockets. Oh my God, I'm going to have to do better with the next. No, listen, it's just a roll because I have air pockets all over the place. This is a, you know, people, you perfect this over a lifetime of making Christmas cookies over and over <laughs> every year. Anyway, so here, look, I have an air pocket. I can show you. It's so cute. Oh, this is awkward. There, look, see? Air pocket. Ideally, those wouldn't be there. Air oh, pocket. Gorgeous. It's fine. Gorgeous. It's totally fine. Okay, now it's time to do the cutting. So you want to take a little paring knife. And you want to, do you see the sort of raggedy end where the marzipan is sticking out? You just want to trim this off at like a 45 degree angle. And this is a discard. I don't like eating raw cookie dough, but if you do, by all means, you may. This is a safe dough to eat. There's no egg in it. Mm -hmm. um, and then you kind of, you want to cut at 45 degree angles back and forth, alternating. Um, so you wind up with, hold on, I've got too many little yeah. things open here. So you wind up with a shape like this. Exactly. Yep, exactly. Okay. So you do that again and again. So Louisa, the, um, we had another question about pot ash. Will you, will you tell us a bit about that? I will. Let me just um, put these over on the baking sheet. So that... Oh, they look so cute. I love no, these. they're really they're cute. adorable. I mean. They look mm -hmm. much fussier than they actually feel to make. It's a very simple dough and it's so easy to work with. Um, I sound like yeah, and I feel like I feel like the finished product is so much more impressive than it, right? It seems so much more impressive than it is. Absolutely. Which is, I feel like, a good high currency. <laughs> um, okay, so potash. So in German baking, there are essentially four leaveners, right? There's yeast the various different types of yeast, instant, fresh, whatever. Um, we don't have dry active yeast here, which in my opinion is a good thing, but that's a different story. Um, then there's baking soda, uh, sorry, baking powder, but baking powder in Germany, and I think in continental Europe is single acting, whereas American and British baking powder is double acting, which makes it far superior, especially if you're doing recipes, baking recipes from um, American or British cookbooks. So all you bakers in Germany, France, Italy, who are wondering why your chocolate chip cookies or American layer cakes aren't really quite the way they should be, it's because you're using single acting baking powder. I always import mine from the US. Oh, that um, is a really good thing to know. Yeah, so like, good thing about baking powder 
is that it's, you know, it lasts for a long time. So I'll buy one of these every time I go visit my parents. Once a friend of mine went to Costco and bought like a five pound jar of it. And then that lasted me for several years. Um, okay, so there's baking powder, there's baking soda. Sorry, sorry, that's another, that's a fifth leavener. Um, and then there is um, baker's ammonia, which is called Hirschhornsalz in Germany. And there is potash, also known as potassium carbonate, carbonate or bicarbonate. And these two leaveners are a pain in the neck to find if you live in not Germany, because in Germany you can buy them at mostly any grocery store, especially during baking season, like Christmas season. But it's really worth seeking them out because some of the recipes that require them, they really, they, they really do do, they work differently and they create a, oh yes, nuts.com has potash. And if I was more organized, I would have affiliate links for you, but I don't, they kindly offered me. <laughs> anyway, that's a different story. Nuts.com has large quantities of potash. Um, but so the recipes that call for them. So for example, the, 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 the old fashioned gingerbread that requires potash, the reason why that is so important in that recipe is because it's resting for so long. If you were using regular baking powder, it would lose potency. It doesn't really, you can't, you can't get baking powder, whether it's single acting or double acting to activate for more than the few minutes where it's being act activated. Whereas potash, um, leavens or works over a very long, long, long period of time. It doesn't lose its potency. It just becomes more. And so what it does also is it creates a really special texture that sort of, I feel like it's, it, it looks a little, you know what honeycomb candy looks like? It's a little bit like that. Not really, because obviously that's a different product. It's all crunchy and stuff, but that sort of really beautiful structure of the crumb, you get that from using potash. And the recipes mm. that call for baker's ammonia include things like the black and white cookies, the traditional black and white cookies, or um, pfeffernusse, um, which are a, a, a Christmas recipe also love, which turned out funnily enough to be one of the most difficult recipes to perfect I think we made that recipe upwards of 10 times until we got it totally right. And we tried using different um, leaveners in that one because they're a relatively simple sort of drop cookie, but the baker's ammonia really made the difference. It made them, um, it gave them a kind of lift and crumb that we just couldn't get any other way. So I hope that helps. That's great. Um, I didn't know any of that stuff. <laughs> um, uh, oh my gosh, what was I going to say? Oh, how about how many pieces do you cut your log into? About how many cookies? Two, one, two, three, and twelve. I got twelve out of that log. Okay, I haven't Not even really. been um, keeping track. I'm just sort of making them all about the same size. Yeah. I also found it really helpful. So in the book, there's a photo of. I think your hands yep. cutting the log and um, you can really get a feel for how big the chunks are because of your hand size. Thank you for noticing and appreciating that because in fact, we, <laughs> we, we were like, we need to have visual representation of this. Oh, my children. <laughs> Close the door, <laughs> sorry. It will quickly get very loud in here if I allow them to enter. Should I? So we're getting we're getting close to the end of our end? time. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, what what? Let's see here. Should we? Do you have some that are baked off that we can show everyone? No, but if we let's see, how long do they bake? They bake for twelve more minutes. I mean, I could stick these in the oven now, and I don't know. We could we could try. For a little more. They also, the, the look of them doesn't change much. They just get a little more plump. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They get sort of dry-ish. And then they, but they're pretty soft. And you'll, you might find yourself worried that they're too soft, but they firm up 
as they as they cool. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna um turn on. My I'm gonna look. I'm gonna look at the Q and A. Um, do you have a favorite uh, Springerle mold source? Um, I have sources in the back of the book. There are several places in the U.S. that you can order them from. Um, usually those will be new, um, obviously newly produced molds and they're, you know, fine. Um, but the, the, the beauty of Springilla molds is that they don't, that they don't get ruined, right? So the older ones are actually really, really beautiful. They have incredibly fine um, handiwork and the images depicted are often a lot more interesting than the new ones. And my best recommendation is to look on eBay, especially eBay Germany. Um, okay. They are relatively expensive, especially the old ones because they're, you know, they're an artisan antique. A lot of people use them as decoration in their kitchens and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just checking my, <laughs> my unclean oven smells a little strange. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so I would say any of the sources in the back of my book and also eBay. Okay. And Joni was actually getting rid of some of her um, molds the other day and I sold them on my Instagram, but they were gone in like 25 minutes. That was crazy. I'll bet, I'll yeah. bet. Um, can I ask you a couple of questions about blogging and writing more generally? Yeah. Um, so someone uh, was asking both of us about our blogs do you do you feel like your your blog has has ended what what are you thinking about it these days well i want to hear your answer although i think i know to a certain extent um i i really don't know at the moment i with the two kids and everything else i find it very difficult to find the mental space needed to blog mm -hmm. and instagram has so easily filled the sort of need to share yeah um, and feel connected to readers mm -hmm. and I really really love that um, mm -hmm. but I miss the old format and I miss having a place to share longer stories and recipes frankly because Instagram it's not great for sharing recipes I mean you can link yeah. to a recipe relatively easily but it's not as I don't find it as easy to share recipes directly. And I think that that's something that I would love to find a new way of doing. I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of toying with the idea of a newsletter. Uh huh. Um, I love being able to subscribe to people's newsletters. Right? Yeah, yeah. I really I like really, it. Yeah, and it feels like a more direct way of communication. And I don't know, I'm thinking about it. What about you? Let's see here. Yeah, I feel like um, you know, my relationship to food and cooking has changed mm -hmm. like yours has. Um, in part, uh, my life is so different from what it was when I first started the blog. I mean, that was 16 years ago. I was 26 years old. Yeah. And I was single and uh, um, now I've been married twice and I have a child. And um, so my relationship to cooking is very, very different. Um, and the things that I enjoy about cooking are very different now. Um, I mean, I get great pleasure out of, out of my repertoire, which mm -hmm. means that, you know, when you're blogging, there's this constant pressure to keep producing right and to keep trying new things and and that was fun for me in a really natural way in the beginning and that's just not where I am right now um mm -hmm. and the other thing is I didn't want to um I never wanted to run ads on the blog or do sponsored posts because I didn't want another I, I, I didn't want another thing sort of hanging over me mm -hmm. the pressure the pressure to show up and write was was enough mm -hmm. um but, you know, I, I also, um, I can only do free stuff for a certain amount of time. Um, cause I'm a, a normal person who has to earn a living. 
So um, that's really tricky too. You know, the way that that blogs changed, um, and the way that my life changed, and I, I needed to um, to to make writing. Um, I needed to make it support me financially. Yeah. Really tricky. Yeah. That is tricky. So, yeah. Um, someone else was asking about your, um, your writing life outside of the blog. Do you have any cookbooks in the works? I know that you wrote a novel. So I wrote the first draft of a novel last year and I have spent this year sort of chewing on it. And my hope had been that I was going to get a second draft done by the end of the year, and it just hasn't happened. Um, so I'm hoping that next year I can find the time. It's, I mean, you know, everything that's been said about novel writing is true. And mm -hmm. I frankly, I find writing with small children, being a creative uh, thinker, yeah, as well as being a mother is at the moment almost impossible for me. I know that there are some exceptions to the rule, but I am currently living the cliched, like, I just can't, I just can't. Yeah. Um, and I also um, have to make money. And the, the deal with novel writing is that you don't make any money until you sell the novel. The full Which is manuscript. really different most of the time from cookbooks and, and nonfiction. Exactly. And we were so spoiled, right? So lucky that our first book deals were nonfiction. And as a result, we had this very sort of straightforward, easy way into mm -hmm. publishing. And now being on the fiction side or, or hoping to be on the fiction side, because I don't actually know that I'll sell the book. I hope I do. Um, yeah, it's a it's humbling. It's a whole different experience. It's really cool, too. I'm really I'm really, I feel really lucky to have gotten as far as I did. I didn't ever think I would actually manage to write even one whole draft of a novel. Um, I remember when I first get... posted it. I, I mean, well, I, <laughs> I remain in awe, but I was in awe of, of reading what you wrote about it on Instagram and of seeing the size. I think you posted like the, the stack that was your manuscript. Um, yes. Yeah. I will tell you, I was extremely proud of myself and I still am to a certain degree. I will, however, temper this by saying that that first draft is utter garbage, <laughs> utter. And I, and I don't want any pity. I don't want any like, no, 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 it's total garbage. It's fine. That's why there needs to be a second draft. Yeah. I will get there one day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I want to read it someday. I'm pulling for you. And, someday, yeah. and, so, and in the meantime, maybe another German cookbook. We'll see. Um, the sort of obvious segue would be a classic German cooking. Um, although between Maya and me, we probably have enough recipes to do a whole second edition of classic German baking. Um, but we'll see. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'd rather, I'd rather, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I think that um, you have a, a full Zoom room of people here who would love to read that should you do it. Oh, well, that's lovely. It's really lovely. It's just so nice. I feel like our community overlaps in a lot of ways. And I just, I love, I love all those people, all those readers and commenters and followers. It's really yeah. great. Yeah, I feel so grateful to have like come up in, in the blog age that way so that um, writing has never felt like uh, a lonely thing for me. It's always felt yeah. like I was in conversation with a whole really world of, of people. And I, that's not the case for everyone. And I feel so lucky. So I know, right? That's such Thanks, a good everybody. way. Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Can we see. go out with one more holiday question, Louisa? Yes. There was a question um, about Hanukkah starts tomorrow. Do you have any suggestions for classic German Jewish recipes that might be fun to bake? Oh, that is such a good question. I mean, I don't actually know that much about what gets traditionally eaten on Hanukkah besides jelly donuts, right? Which I believe are called sufganiyot, which is the yeah. Hebrew word. But of course the jelly donut is a German Berlin product. We're very proud of our jelly donuts here. They're very famous. Um, and I actually have a recipe for them in the book, jelly donuts. 
They're really fun. Do I have, do I? No, I don't wait in the, in the first book, my Berlin kitchen. That's where the recipe is. Right. Laura, do you have copies of my Berlin kitchen available too? We will. Yes. I think we have one in the shop right now, but we'll get more for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, and then your Christmas traditions. Do you, as your family, do you tend to follow more sort of German traditions, American traditions? How do you celebrate at your house? Uh, our Christmas is such a mutt. So basically, um, my mother's Italian, my father's American Jewish, and I live here in Berlin and my, my husband's family is German. But I grew up celebrating Christmas at our neighbor's house who are like um, almost aristocratic Hamburg Germans. And so I grew up with the full German Christmas experience of getting like evening gowns, roast goose, um, poems, rhyming poems on every single gift that the gift receiver had to read in order to decipher what was in the gift. I mean, wow. full on. Candles on the tree, no electric lights, total heresy. And so now that we celebrate in our sort of little nuclear family, we do kind of a hybrid of things. First of all, we celebrate on Christmas Eve, not on, so Christmas Eve is when we do the full, the whole thing. I do sort of an Italian fish-based dinner uh, we wrap, unwrap presents. We don't do the rhyming present, the rhyming guessing game because that's just too much. And we <laughs> normally don't really get dressed up. But this year, I have decided that we're getting dressed up for Christmas Eve because because it's a terrible year. And yeah, I, when else have you gotten dressed up this year? <laughs> you know, like you might as well do it for Christmas Eve. So yeah, exactly. So um, I, these went a little bit too long. My oven's a little feisty, but um, you see how they're kind of like plump and ooh. They're delightful. And when yeah. someone was asking what Bieberle meant, I just did like a quick internet search and someone actually has the recipe posted as Beaverly. You know, like they actually called it beaver with like L-E on it. And so I just thought that was funny. That is, yes. Yeah, like Beaverla, you know, like it had, it had sort of evolved, I guess, for, for them in their uh, tradition. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you for checking yeah. that. Yeah, sure. Louisa, can you, um, can you hold one up or? I will, don't, yes. Don't I have support a yourself. I was going to say, don't burn yourself. <laughs> oh my oh, God. They, they are lovely. so so they are truly dear. They're I, like they're just a very dear cookie. I can't. I ser I'm gonna make them. I have like no time to bake right now, and I don't care. I'm gonna stay up. But you see how easy they are. Like, there's no, no skill required. This is what I'm doing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and dough that needs to rest for a long time sounds right up my alley. So I'm gonna make some <laughs> other things too. <laughs> I'm gonna make some oh. of these other things too. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, much. everyone. This has been so great. Molly and Louisa, thank you so much. Louisa suggested this via email about a month ago, and I just thought it sounded like the best idea. And judging from the comments, I think um, everyone just really appreciated a little, like a little warm baking hug from both of you. So thank you so much. Maybe we can thank make you. an annual thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know what? I actually, I was just sitting here thinking the same thing actually so if you're both on for it I will be, I be up for it excellent definitely thank all you right. so so much right. we'll have an audience for sure it looks like all right thank you so much both of you the book is available on bookorder.com as is the fixed stars thank you everyone happy holidays and stay safe and healthy Bye. Thank thanks you. everybody thank thanks Louisa thank, yeah, you, thank you so much to everyone. So <laughs> bye. bye everyone bye.